via telephone, the Attorney General and candidate for Governor, Patrick Morrissey. Patrick, good morning to you, sir. Hey, good morning, gentlemen. It's a beautiful day in the eastern panhandle, a bit cloudy, but uh, still quite cool this morning. Are you local right now? I am. I am. I'm up on the mountain. So uh, looking down over the valley, everything is uh, incredible. I was said I know when the rain's going to come through, but uh, it's a good start to the day. Dude, you should be here in studio with me. <laughs> Well, we're going to have to do that. I'm going to be up at the Berkeley Fair tonight, and uh, we're going to be busy in the Eastern Panhandle this week. So uh, we should definitely do that next time I come up. We're willing to forgive your absence today if the next time you come up, you're here and you bring food. That's usually how this works. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe some food from the fair, right? Yeah. Either uh, uh, this week at the Berkeley Fair and a couple weeks at the Jefferson Fair. So. I'm excited to get me back. It's nice to sleep in your own bed and nice. uh, make your way down. If you're bringing fair food, sir, we uh, we like funnel cakes. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't like yeah. that? <laughs> it's like saying I breathe oxygen, right? <laughs> hey, uh, Patrick, there's quite the scramble going on for your job as attorney general as uh, you will depart for uh, a shot at uh, the, the seat in the governor's house. Uh, do you keep an active eye on what's happening for those who'd like to be the next AG? You know, I do. I, I care a lot about the attorney general position. I want to make sure that it's the office is left in good hands. Uh, but there's a very active primary going on, and I have respect for all the candidates who are running. And so I think we're going to be learning a lot more about all of them over the course of the upcoming months. And you know, my goal is to make sure that a lot of the work that we've done gets carried on into the future in terms of uh, the opioid work, in terms of taking on federal overreach. And this is the professionalism of the office, ensuring that when it comes to enforcement of our laws, we have to be blind to political affiliation or economic status. So I'm definitely uh, interested and I'm watching, uh, but obviously we're doing our day job. And also I have a, a side project as well. Of course, we're working uh, – and I'm running for governor, and that part's going very well, too. I thought when you said you had a side project, you were going to say, I'm starting to be an Uber driver now, too. So <laughs> that would be kind of neat to see the AG pick you up where you're trying to get to the convenience store. Uh, Patrick, um, we had uh, uh, yesterday, uh, Mr. McCuskey was on the program, and we talked about the West Virginia First Foundation. In an appearance the previous week, uh, J.B. had stated some of his thoughts on the West Virginia First Foundation as to oversight by the AG's office. I received a call from somebody else who said the AG doesn't have direct oversight over the West Virginia First Foundation. Can you tell me what the exact truth is here in terms of the AG's yeah. involvement with the foundation, its money, and what it does it doesn't do? Absolutely. So the uh, West Virginia Attorney General's office does have uh, oversight uh, over the West Virginia First Foundation, but it's a private entity. So technically, it's subject to all the rules that apply to charitable organizations here in the state. Uh, but that was included. There's a line in the West Virginia First Memorandum of Understanding that uh, places the Attorney General's office in an oversight role. Now, to be clear, the goal of this is to have a public-private partnership, and it's not to have the attorney general's office or any office of state government uh, riding herd or being on top of it. The goal has been to make sure that this organization can have the best expertise. It can be very nimble in terms of how it uh, spends its resources. And the process we're going through now is the one that's decided to help ensure that there's going to be responsibility with the uh, foundation to make the right decisions that target this terrible epidemic. There are six board members that are picked, and they were um, elected in the regions. There are five more board members picked by the governor. And then the attorney general uh, does pick the executive director, but then the organization is run by the executive director, and uh, this is meant to be a private a structure and i'm really excited about that because for the first time ever west virginia not only has a plan to target the drug epidemic but we're going to have resources to do it so i'm not sure what you know specifically someone had said but uh this the role of the ag is to pick the executive director 
and of course there's broad oversight, but the AG does not run the organization. The AG does not decide um, how resources are spent by the structure. Very good. I appreciate the clarification there. Uh, I'd like your thoughts on the Supreme Court's decision with the Mountain Valley Pipeline. You know, this was a terrific decision, and it's good for all of West Virginia and the country, quite frankly. Uh, this is about promoting America's energy independence, and we've been working for a long time to try to get that pipeline uh, open because we know it matters for West Virginia. Thousands of jobs, uh, so much in terms of revenue for a lot of the local counties in West Virginia. And this is a tremendous opportunity uh, to really build out a pipeline and finish a pipeline that could eventually allow uh, Marcellus Shale and the natural gas that uh, comes from that area to go ultimately out to the Atlantic Ocean. And think about that for a moment. West Virginia obviously has always powered the country from an energy perspective and now as an opportunity to play a major role in terms of natural gas play. And that's just outstanding. And so we've been all working on this. I think it's been a team effort. I give a lot of credit to the federal delegation for the insertion of the language uh, in the recent bill that helped uh, ensure that this would happen in the courts. And then, of course, my office uh, submitted a brief representing the state of West Virginia uh, to help defend that language that the federal representatives got inserted. And there were a lot of other people stepping up to help. So this, these are the things that happen when everyone works together and does positive things for our state. I'd like to ask you also about the Chevron Doctrine and why you don't think it's a good thing, if you could first explain what it is. Yeah, sure. So a lot of people say, hey, Morrissey, what are you focusing on the Chevron uh, Doctrine? Uh, because how much does that uh, relate to West Virginia? And the answer is quite a bit. So every time you have a federal agency that's making a decision, uh, obviously there are various rules of the road in terms of the authority that they have to act. And so if you go back to the 1980s, there was actually a case, a uh, Chevron a case, that dealt with the administrative rules and the level of deference that's provided to these unelected bureaucrats when they were making a decision. And uh, for Chevron deference, there is a question of when you have an ambiguity in the statute, uh, the courts for a long, long time have said when there is that ambiguity, we're going to defer our interpretation of what the language means to the agency. And so what's happened, unfortunately, over time with this doctrine is that so many people within these agencies have found so many ambiguities that they've been able to grow their power and really do incredibly um, critical things that perhaps were never intended by Congress when Congress wrote the language in the first place. So one of the things we're trying to do is to step back and say, wait a minute, Congress needs to have clear statements when it writes laws, and there shouldn't be deference to these bureaucrats. Congress should say what it means, and when it does that, everyone's going to be more clear about the law, and we won't have to be in court as much. And also, these unelected bureaucrats, what people frequently call the swamp, their power is going to be reduced. That matters a lot for West Virginia, whether it's our EPA cases, whether it's uh, related to any of the decisions of the federal agencies. Mr. Miller. So, Patrick, how do you kind of put the pressure on the the Congress then to, to do a better job as far as the proper language to be able to, you know, hey, this is what we say, this is what we mean, and it's clear so that it can't be interpreted in a different way? No, I, I think part of the way you do it is through these cases that we've been taking up. So we obviously are the lead uh, state in terms of trying to get rid of Chevron deference, but we were also the lead party in the famous West Virginia of the EPA case where the Supreme Court ruled that when you have a major question of the day, something of great economic or political significance, Congress needs to be clear in its statement, clear in its language. Um, otherwise, the agency 
can't take up the matter. And that was used to push back against Biden's Green New Deal and uh, his carbon emissions plan. So to the extent that the courts start pushing back on what these agency bureaucrats are doing, I think it makes it easier because if Congress wants something to happen, they're going to have to be more clear in their language. And uh, I think it's important to educate Congress as to the importance of uh, major questions doctrine and Chevron deference and doing their job and delegating very clearly to these agencies because, uh, quite frankly, the body has gotten quite lazy over a long period of time, and I think that's caused some of the problems with the growth of the administrative state. Let me also jump backwards to the Supreme Court ruling as uh, we talked about the pipeline. Uh, it, does that affect groups or, or I don't know what you would, you know, environmentalists and so forth that may still want to file suits and slow things down? How quickly will we maybe see operations get back in line for this pipeline to, to continue? I mean, I think part of the reason that the party went and immediately appealed the decision in the Fourth Circuit is because they wanted to finish it quickly and to get everything done up and running uh, before the end of the year, uh, because it's still a very small uh, area that needs to be completed. So I do expect that uh, this project will get completed uh, quickly. There's still an opportunity for additional legal challenges, but I'm very hopeful that uh, now that the Supreme Court has ruled that it's clear that at least the high court is not going to be tolerating efforts to just delay these out into infinity because that's what's happened with the pipeline to date. You go through a process. Uh, there were six state and federal agencies involved in the approval of these permits, and you'd go through it, and then the court would stop it. And then you'd theoretically address the problem that was being raised, and you'd go back uh, to the beginning, and then you'd march through it, then you go back into court and you lose again and again and again. That's actually what happened. That's what caused Congress to step in and to fix it. Uh, but there's been so much due diligence on this project by federal and state agencies uh, that I'm hopeful they're going to be able to get this done without undue delays. Patrick, I want to go back to the Chevron doc doctrine. Um, it's caused a lot of federal overreach, obviously. Yep. Can you um, offer some examples of some of that federal overreach that, that really affects West Virginia that you think really we – other things beside what we've talked about already, the other things that you, you want to try to try to sort of push back against the feds on? Yeah, a couple things. So first of all, uh, when it comes to uh, EPA-related questions, we know that – we have been fighting back against uh, the EPA. It's gone after our coal fire power plants and our natural gas uh, opportunities. And whether that arises in the form of carbon emissions or it comes in the form of just the scope of the power of where you can regulate at the coal fire power plant or it comes to uh, the pipelines and the methane that comes out under the methane rules uh, that have been issued in the past. These issues can arise in the context of the waterways of the United States. I know I think I've been on your program and I've talked a little bit about uh, waters of the United States. And so there can always be questions about that as well. So they really arise a lot in air and water cases, but that can arise with any uh, federal agency at all in terms of uh, HHS. It can arise in terms of the uh, ATF uh, with uh, guns. Right now, we're dealing with a question on pistol braces, where for many years, the ATF had decided that it was going to uh, allow these pistol braces to go on. There were no issues with it. There was no bar under the statute. And then uh, the agency under President Biden discovered, and I use that word lightly, that it had new authority to regulate uh, pistol braces and uh, trying to find ambiguity in the statute to justify it when forever in the past they had taken an opposite position. Well, that hurts everyday West Virginians. And interestingly, we've brought a case. Uh, we're, we're leading a 25-state coalition uh, that's actually out in North Dakota to get rid of that uh, pistol brace issue. But a lot of these questions involve administrative power because 
when an agency comes up with a completely new way of interpreting the statute and they don't go through Congress, that's a deep concern for West Virginians and for all Americans. Patrick, can you, uh, for our listeners, can you just describe quickly what a pistol brace is? Yeah, so a pistol brace is an accessory um, to a, a firearm that traditionally is used in order to help facilitate the shooting of the gun. And it's frequently used by individuals who are seniors or who are disabled, and it allows uh, the person to more firmly grip the uh, the gun and fire it uh, straight and, and accurately. Uh, so it comes in all different forms, um, but what the ATF is trying to do is to take uh, that firearm and convert the definition of the firearm into a short barrel rifle. And for those listening, uh, many people know about this, that actually is going to change the process by which you can acquire uh, the gun. So you'd have to go through uh, and get a different stamp, a different cost. It might take longer in order to obtain the short barrel rifle than it would if something's just considered a traditional firearm. And so uh, right now, uh, the ATF uh, has been pushing this. And in fact, uh, if you do not sign up with the ATF's registry, you would be considered um, a felon. You could be subject to charges uh, because you haven't registered. And that's one of the provisions that we're fighting and we've been waiting in the courts for. Now, the Fifth Circuit has actually uh, knocked out the uh, pistol brace uh, rule, which is very, very good. Uh, we've been waiting on our case, and we're hopeful we can hear back and get a result soon. Is there, um, just to change change gears just a little bit, is there anything coming down the pike? Are there any uh, major judgments coming down the pike as far as the opioid crisis? Because I know it's still, I mean, it's still here. Sometimes it's on the back burner. It's sort of like, sure. it's become sort of like gas prices. We're just sort of used to it, so it's not as it's not as in the forefront. But what is going on with that right now? Yeah, I think right now the biggest uh, aspect of the work we're doing of fighting the drug epidemic in West Virginia is trying to ensure that the a structure that was created uh, that we negotiated with the counties and cities, the West Virginia First Foundation, that comes into existence and that it's getting all the support that it needs. Uh, and in terms of the ongoing opioid cases, uh, we have completed all of our manufacturer, pharmacy, and distribution cases. And so now uh, all of those cases, they had gone out to the counties and cities, for releases, because in order to do this, this is not a typical case that it only that it doesn't just involve the attorney general's office. It involves uh, all of the counties and cities across West Virginia. So when I negotiate a settlement, I have to go to the counties and cities for the releases and for approval. Well, that process is basically complete. And now that gets uh, resolved by the a judge, the panel of judges, once they have the total gross number, then they get to make decisions about the attorney's fees and the costs. And then the process goes on. But uh, we're, we're complete with all of our pending cases. There are still some remnant cases by the counties and the cities uh, for a few other defendants that were not subject to a lawsuit by the state. Uh, but I would say that the litigation has uh, tailed down. Now, a lot of the work now has been really focused to draw more attention to the deadly fentanyl scourge, try to convince the feds to list fentanyl as a weapon of mass destruction uh, to help law enforcement any way we can. We, of course, don't have the original criminal authority uh, to step up and help the way we uh, might uh, want to, but we're in a place where uh, we're able to at least give a lot of counsel and help to the prosecutors and to law enforcement to try to push to get them the resources they need to fight this terrible epidemic. Patrick, you mentioned the push to have fentanyl as a, a weapon of mass destruction. W what would that do in the fight against that drug? Well, probably the first thing that it would do would be to provide uh, additional resources and bring in other federal agencies who have tools uh, to go after this issue. 
Uh, I think everyone listening knows uh, the problem with fentanyl and these uh, basic ingredients that come in uh, originally from China. They get shipped to the drug cartels. They're finished. Then they come up into the United States and in West Virginia. Well, this is a national security problem. So uh, when you list something as a weapon of mass destruction, then you get all the other federal resources involved. You might be able to get DOD and other agencies involved down at the border and having specific efforts to block the uh, fentanyl from coming into our country. That's a huge, huge problem. And, of course, it's become really one of the drugs of choice that's slaughtering so many people. So it's really a significant uh, question about federal resources. And as you guys all know, in West Virginia, this still remains a big problem because West Virginia has the highest fentanyl death overdose rate in the nation, and we need more help. We need more help in terms of some of the federal agency resources. We need more help in terms of prosecutions coming out of Maine Justice, the Department of Justice, and uh, Merrick Garland, and we want to shine more attention on that. Our guest has been Attorney General Patrick Morrissey, candidate for governor in the state. I want to close out with scams. Patrick, I got a uh, a new one that's been hitting my phone every uh, couple of weeks, and it is uh, somebody calling me saying that a person has left me as their uh, contact, and this this is the sheriff's department calling me from I think Tennessee or something south, and uh, I need to call this number because this person left me as left my name as a contact, and they've not been able to find that person, and they're uh, going to arrest them because they're skipping bail or or something to that effect. Are you aware of this one at all? You know, I hadn't heard of that one, but I've heard of very similar ones, but not that specific one from Tennessee. But it's a good lesson for everyone listening to know that scams can arise uh, anytime and from any place, uh, because frequently our citizens get called. It may be from a, a, a sheriff that's in another jurisdiction or someone that's pretending to be a first responder, and they're calling trying to lure people in. So the key thing for all these scams is to never, ever, ever provide your personal identifiable information and give them the tools to rip you off. Uh, if you're interested in, in something, by all means, research it heavily or call our office, but do not just give all your information away. And sadly, scams have been happening since the beginning of time. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it, we just want to get the word out since uh, there are probably many, many thousands that are going on at this very moment here in West Virginia and across our country. Patrick, quickly, you say not giving out information, uh, and especially all of your information. I mean, not even like a telephone number, correct? I mean, obviously somebody's already gotten it in, in that aspect, but I mean, when you talk about information, just the smallest pieces of information can be used by a scam artist, correct? Well, they, they can, and in part because what happens is that uh, if they obtain some little piece of information, they're going to use it in order to try to leverage you to give more information. So, uh, for instance, one of the things we've been worried about is when you had these breaches. Remember with the federal government or with Target or these uh, big data dumps where these criminals had access to all this data. And it could just be phone numbers in some instances. Then you allow a scammer to get on the phone with you and say, uh, your your name, or they may know something about you, or they may know some numbers of your social security uh, uh, number or your credit card number, and they'll say that, and people will think that it's real, it's legitimate. People use the information as power in order to obtain more information and to rip you off. So that's why it, you're exactly right. Anytime someone has a little bit of information, they could use it to get a bit more, and it's a it's a terrifying process. Uh, for those that have sometimes been ripped off. Patrick, thank you very much for your time this morning. As always, greatly appreciate it. Hey, guys, thank you. Enjoy, and we'll uh, hopefully see you soon uh, physically on site. So I'll work to do that in the upcoming week. With there, funnel cake. With funnel cake. <laughs> <laughs> the funnel cake at 830 in the morning. That'll go over well. It always does. Always it's like does. a donut. <laughs> it's true. It's just a big donut. It's just a differently shaped donut. <laughs>